Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of the School Safety Free Period. I'm Amanda Klinger. And I'm Dr. Amy Klinger. And we are with the Educators School Safety Network. We are a national nonprofit organization and we provide school safety training and resources and technical assistance and professional development to schools throughout the United States and Canada. And we're very serious and we take this work very seriously and we are very academic, but every once in a while, just about once a week, we are a little bit less formal. We're still real serious, but we're a little bit less formal. And we have our school safety free period where we talk about issues that are happening um, in the realm of school safety. And sometimes they're absurd and sometimes it's really serious stuff. And, but we always try to have some important takeaways. So what are we gonna talk about this week? Well, uh, we're talking about some important stuff and actually the absurdity was what was happening before, what we're gonna okay. talk about. Um, That's a nice change of pace. Yeah, usually it's the other way around where we see this thing and then we go, isn't that absurd? Well, now we're going, hey, finally, we're um, addressing some of the ongoing absurdity. So um, many of you may, many of our listeners may have heard of this already, but I think it's really important to have a little bit of a conversation and maybe unpack some of it. So I'm referring to the uh, position paper that came out this week. Um, from two of the largest teachers unions, the American Federation of Teachers, the AFT, and the National Education Association, the NEA. And they combined with the advocacy group Every Town for Gun Safety. And they are talking about lockdown drills or more specifically active shooter drills. And unfortunately, those two things become sort of synonymous that we assume every time we do a lockdown drill, it is an active shooter drill, when clearly that should not be the case. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But um, they are talking about the idea of finally getting, you know, what, what Amanda and I have been arguing about or arguing for, I guess is a better way, uh, to really take a hard critical look at the unintended consequences of doing hyper-realistic or surprise active shooter drills. Mm -hmm. And Amanda, I think you can probably take 30 seconds and sort of recap some of the ones we have run up against over the years um, to kind of give people an idea of what we're talking about here. Not just, oh, we need to do an active shooter drill, mm -hmm. let's do that, but the more large scale problem that we've been seeing. Yeah, and we talk about this all the time. And, and there's the concern that we feel like, um, and erroneously, and with a lack of evidence, we feel like we have to do these ultra-realistic, totally surprise drills, sometimes where we don't even say if it's a drill. Um, and there are a number of concerns. And number one, um, we don't have to train our third grade teachers and our third graders for realistic active shooter scenarios. Um, and that, I think, fallacy kind of comes to us from a military or a law enforcement training mentality, which is people who are entering law enforcement and people who are entering the military do need to have ultra-realistic training um, in combat, for example, because they might experience combat. Um, because they are much more predisposed to do that. Right. And, and the fact of the matter is, our third graders and our third grade teachers probably will not encounter an active shooter, statistically speaking. So that doesn't mean that we don't think about it or we don't talk about it or we don't prepare for it, but we don't need to prepare for it in this ultra realistic immersive way. And then I do want to say one thing about the talking about a drill, saying it's a drill, and I feel like I'm a broken record. I feel like we talk about this all the time, but there is no teaching value in saying there's an active shooter. For real, there's an active shooter. And then it turns out it was a drill. We can yeah. still have a drill. We can still have a drill be appropriately realistic. We can have people take a drill seriously and really practice, but we can say that it's a drill right at the very beginning and continue to repeat that it's a drill um, throughout. And that does not diminish the efficacy uh, of what we're trying to accomplish. And I think it's really important to, to make that point that what this position paper is coming out from the unions um, really is not saying we should never do active shooter training mm -hmm. for teachers. They're not saying that. They are not saying um, that we should never discuss active shooter response. What they are saying is the same thing that we've been saying, which is we should not be doing surprise drills where people, not surprise as in unannounced, mm -hmm. but where we are pretending that there is an active shooter event yeah. when there isn't. And that's really critical. Um, I personally, and I think we as an organization, do not have a problem with coming on without warning and saying, we are going to do a drill now. 
we are going to do an active shooter drill now. Just mm -hmm. like when we do a fire drill, we don't have to say, hey, next Tuesday at two o'clock, we're gonna do a fire drill. We can say, we're gonna do a fire drill today, or we're doing a fire drill sometime this week. And then we can do that. And we can say, we're gonna be doing an active shooter drill at some point. But the difference you, is when can you, you come speak on- to, Can you speak to the utility of that, of the unannounced, unplanned aspect? Can you speak to well, the, like, what do you gain from that? Because well, you do gain I think something. Part of, the, part of the issue, especially if we look at fire drills, is that you get into this sort of mindset of, we're just going through the motions. We're not really assessing, what would I do? And are we really prepared? And do I really respond in the right way? Mm -hmm. You're just going, hey, and you know, we've seen that in so many schools where we do our fire drill at dismissal. So everybody walks out and now we've done our fire drill. Yeah. Or everybody has their backpacks and their coats on and then we do a fire drill. Yeah. As opposed to saying, we want to really give people an opportunity to put into practice the training they've had and say, okay, this is what I need to do. And this is how I would respond. And oh no, look, I don't have my keys with me. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Or all the things that we want to accomplish out of a drill, as opposed to essentially sneaking up behind someone and screaming in their ear so that you can scare them, so that you can go, see, you were really scared. Yeah. That's not really what we're trying to accomplish. And so we're really advocating, as is this position paper, that we are not going to pretend that there is an active shooter when there's not. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can be unannounced, but that's very different than saying this is what, you know, there, there is an active shooter in the building and later on going, sorry, there's not really. We were just we just wanted to see what you would do. Yeah, that's really, really counterproductive. So that's the first part. And the second part is the idea of these hyper realistic drills where we are really simulating gunfire, simulating an attack forcing people to live that nightmare. Having people um, dramatize casualties and injuries, act, yeah. acting that out. Yeah, and, and, and there's a couple of problems with that. Number one is when trauma sets in, we've really shut down any learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. But also what you just alluded to is, is the idea of using students as props. So I need you to go lay here and look like you got shot, or I need you to run in terror because that's how we train what to do with crowd control. Mm -hmm. um, that's really inappropriate to use students, especially without their consent or their knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I, think use it's them as props. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to maybe look a little bit of how did we get here? The way that we got here is because law enforcement and fire and emergency agencies wanted to train how would we respond to an active shooter event in the school. And in order to make it realistic for law enforcement, for their training purposes, they need people to pretend to be scared, to pretend to be injured and, and fatally wounded, and so on and so forth. And that would be a drill that would be serving a training audience of participants of law enforcement folks. And then people got the idea, well, wait a minute. If I'm using these teachers, these volunteer teachers, as pretend dead bodies and pretend victims, why not? Let's use this as an opportunity to train them as well. And, and the problem is that we didn't think critically, we have a completely different training audience here. And to be fair, it is appropriate to have trainings for law enforcement and educators together. You can do tabletop drills. Yes. There is a time and a place and a way that that is an effective training or an effective drill for both populations. However, the hyper-realism that is maybe desired for a law enforcement training audience is not the same requirement for educators. Educators need practice in decision-making and do I have the tools that I need? Do I know what I'm supposed to do? And am I able to do those things? And even logistics. We need practice in the logistics of what does it look like when you have a whole bunch of people trying to leave through this one exit? What does it look like when I am trying to move these kids from here to there? So even the logistics, but you don't get any of those things that you just described right. when everyone is in complete and utter panic. Mm -hmm. And chaos. You don't. You don't get to to any of those. You know, very, very valuable learning outcomes. And, and I want to quote the president of the NEA. Um, she says, "So traumatizing students as we work to keep students safe from gun violence is not the answer. That is why if schools are going to do drills, they need to take steps to ensure the drills do more good." than harm. And I think that's what everybody yeah. is really advocating for is not that we should or shouldn't do drills, but if we're going to do drills, we need to do them in a way that they are beneficial as opposed to the undermining what we're trying to do.
Absolutely. And, you know, I, when we when we talk about this, we I always sort of bring up other examples. You know, when you're flying, they don't make you practice putting on the life vest. They don't make you practice opening up the overwing door and sliding down the thing. They don't make you practice. They don't depressurize the cabin so that you can figure it, so that you can feel, feel how what it, awful it feels. Yeah. So, I, But, however, that doesn't mean that they just go, I don't know, flying is flying. Best of luck if something happens. We still talk about it. There is still a safety briefing. There's information printed in your card. And I think really it's important to think about that we're trying to find a balance. What is the balance of a drill that does more good than harm? And and especially, you know, what are the things that we're forgetting to do when we're so busy traumatizing everyone with these ultra realistic drills on this one type of hazard? And I think you alluded to this a tiny bit at the beginning. Lockdown drills should not only be about a active shooter scenario, because there are other occasions where a lockdown would be an appropriate response. Yeah. Um, for example, if we have a, a police response in the neighborhood and we're going to do a level one lockdown where we're pulling kids off the playground, everyone's inside and we're keeping a better stock of who's coming in and out of the building. That's an appropriate way to practice. How would that response? Those are like? the things that we don't do very well. Mm -hmm. Those are the things we should be practicing. And those are the things that happen much more often. There, there are low level events that re involve some type of a response, some type of a lockdown response that does not involve an active shooter or an active threat and, like that. And I do think we have to acknowledge, and I don't wanna to go too far off into the weeds, but I'm just throwing this out there for, for everyone's consideration. I think we do have to acknowledge that there is a certain dynamic at play here, that if we subjected any other class of people to this level of trauma and fright and inconvenience, whatever you want to call it. So if the next time you went to a movie theater, um, they started out with a safety drill in the beginning where they pretended that the movie theater was on fire and had smoke and flames and heat, and then went, oh, see, we were just training. Imagine the outrage that the general population would have at being treated in such a fashion. But yet here our most vulnerable populations are you know, in our schools. And we're just now beginning to see some of the outrage. And I think that bears some consideration of why are, do we think that educators and kids are just supposed to take it in the name of safety? And, and I understand we, do, we never want these events to occur. Clearly, there's lots of things we can do to prevent them, but I think we have to strike that balance that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And we've talked at great length about all of these different things, but I think they do a good job in this white paper of really talking about trying to, to kind of create a threshold um, that we're not going to simulate an actual shooting. We're going to give people advance notice of a drill. We're gonna work with mental health to make sure that we're creating age appropriate or developmentally appropriate um, and trauma-informed drills, which I think is the piece that's kind of missing. And I love the fact that they included and in tracking the effects of the drill. So there's that debriefing. What did we get out of this? What did we learn? What didn't work? What did work? What could we do better? And I think that's a piece that's really missing too. Mm -hmm. So kudos that we are really taking a little bit more of a comprehensive approach to this instead of just going, don't do any realistic drills, that we're kind of that that paper kind of uh, delineates what we're looking for. Yeah, and I and I talked about this before, and we've talked about it on this podcast before, but I think this white paper is sort of a formalization of these lingering, nagging questions that people have started to have, especially yeah. educators and sometimes parents who have uh, children who have been traumatized by drills like this. And the question is not, stop doing this. I don't care about school safety. No one's ever implying that. The question is always, does this really make sense? Does this, does this prescription really fit the disease? Does this, is this really an appropriate way to approach what we're trying to accomplish? And I think um, it, you talk about this, you know, of, of all the things that they're talking about in this white paper, it is that. It's not, don't do it, don't do it. It's, what makes sense? Does this really make sense? Is this developmentally appropriate? Does this have the most good and the least harm? And I, I think that's a really powerful way uh, to think about it. And I, I think that is a, a change that's starting to happen gradually. Um, I, you know, I have, uh, I teach school safety courses at the graduate level for people who are getting um, their licensure to be um, educational leaders and educational administrators. And I have them share their experiences with school safety uh, in their schools, in their teaching capacity now. And 
every once in a while, pretty much every semester, you'll have someone who will talk about this ultra realistic drill that they went through. Yeah. And depending on how they apprise it, their co- their colleagues and their classmates will go, that sounds really scary. And then someone else will go, yeah. And then the floodgates will open of everyone going, that sounds really scary. Was that really necessary? Was that really, Im- really important? And so I think subtly and appropriately challenging those presumptions that, well, we have to. It has to be realistic. That's how we train no. Marines. So that's how we have to train this. It has to be that way. Well, what I think we also need to deal with is a little bit of the potential pushback, which is, well, you know, we shouldn't, you know, the, the whole snowflake idea. And what do you mean it's creating anxiety and, oh, come on, you know, toughen up, blah, 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 all that, that, that sometimes we will hear. And I think if we go back and look historically, um, just in my lifetime in public education, you know, because I'm old as dirt, I guess. But if you look just back in my lifetime, well, or prior to me, actually, um, when we were having kids hide under their desks for air raid, uh, for, you know, the, with the, the nuclear anni- annihilation. Mm-hmm. But I can remember in first grade, in, you know, the, the late 60s, we were shown really graphic movies of a tornado destroying a house and with the idea of that's going to teach you to be afraid of tornadoes and to really listen when we do a tornado drill. And so there's this misguided notion that we have had historically. And we look back at those things and go, how ridiculous that you're showing second graders a graphic representation of destruction of a tornado. How ridiculous you're putting first graders under a desk and telling them a nuclear bomb is coming. Mm-hmm. What do you think we're doing right now? Yeah. We're, we're putting second graders in the back of a classroom, stacking furniture, telling them to use their scissors to fight a gunman, which I just heard this week someone was exposed to, their kindergartner was exposed to that. So we're putting little kids holding scissors ready to fight a gunman while we have a drill that is they don't know is a drill that they really think that guy is coming in. How is that any less barbaric than what we were doing to kids in the 50s and the 60s? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, we're going to look back at this, you know, our, our children's children are going to look back and go, wait, they did what to yeah. you guys? Well, and I think, you know, sometimes the pushback of, of the barbarism of that is that it's, you know, that it's totally unacceptable that we have to prepare for safety in our schools. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, when on the more political side of this discussion, that it's, the barbarism of that is what what people are upset about is that well we shouldn't have to prepare for safety in our schools and, and I think there is a middle ground which is we shouldn't be preparing for safety in our schools in a way that's so barbaric that we can still provide people with skills and capabilities and preparation and feeling empowered and we can do that in a way that is not barbaric um, but it, that is not that well first graders shouldn't have to know any safety skills. Well, that's not true. We teach, we teach first graders not to go with strangers. We teach first graders how to stop, drop, and roll. Um, that's not barbaric. That is preparing them with skills. And I think that you can do that in a way that makes a kid feel better, to feel safe, and to know that I have skills, as opposed to I'm blissfully unaware um, for the potential for danger in the world. Yeah. You know, wearing a bike helmet is a way for me to know, you know what, I have this helmet on, I can be safe in the way that I ride my bike. It's not that I have a bike helmet on, I'm probably going to get a traumatic brain injury. Well, and and we see that all the way, you know, each generation has had, it was, you know, the Cold War, it was the, the tornado thing, it was the stranger danger thing, it was, you know, the fire thing. Each generation has had those where we've introduced that safety concept into the lexicon, but we have made it very traumatic at first. Until we have said, wait, 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 maybe there's a better way. And I think we're at that moment now where we're saying, hey, maybe there's a better way. So I want to talk about a couple quick examples because I think these sort of, um, these all happened kind of simultaneously this week. And I think it's interesting to see the connection between these. So this one is talking about um, this, the school district of Philadelphia and that they have had an average of one lockdown every other school day for the past 10 years. And it was talking about how they are changing the word lockdown. And I'm not saying this is necessarily good or bad, but it will be only used when there's an unknown individual inside the building. So they're going to go to, then they'll be using lockdown. Otherwise, they're going to use lock in for a fight inside the building or lock out for violence in the neighborhood. Um, And so while we can argue with, I'm not sure that I would necessarily 
do everything exactly the way they're doing it. But the motivation for this is that they have talked about how they are finding all these kids that have been traumatized by having their education interrupted all the time by this mm -hmm. potential threat of violence. Mm -hmm. um, and their safety director talks about, we should be looking at this trauma, especially for young kids having to go mm -hmm. through this. So, you know, this is just a, a sort of a graphic example of where they are finally getting to this point of saying, you know what, this is too much. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I guess if we read between the lines, we're seeing situations where every other day there is the belief that something really bad is happening when in reality they're locking down for lower level and different types of events. Yeah. So I think that one's kind of a, a sort of a exact representation of what we're talking about. Yeah. And that again speaks to the notion of having different response procedures for different types of risks and hazards. And, yeah. you know, an ultra realistic drill um, only about this one type of threat that we're, we're really doing a disservice because we never practice um, any of the other lower level types of things, because that doesn't need to be scary. You know, if we are in a level one lockdown because there's something happening in the neighborhood, that doesn't need to be scary for a kid in school. It's just, we're doing things a little bit differently. We're paying a little bit closer attention. We can have a normal day here in the classroom because we're, we're really not in direct danger. And so I think that's an important part of it as well. And I think this is an example of where they're, you know, everything is treated as a nail. I mean, they have a hammer and, and everything's a nail. Yeah. And now they're sort of going, wait, 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 this is, this is not working. And so, you know, I, I give them the best of luck and let us know what we can do to help. Associated with that was a study that also came out this week at Northwestern, Yale, and, and Stanford uh, researchers. And they talked about the rate of antidepressant use among youth and how it spikes in the wake of fatal school shootings in neighboring districts. So it talks about the idea that they looked at 44 schools and 15 shootings, and they found that antidepressant use, antidepressant use among students rose by a 21% on average in the communities where the fatal shooting occurred. So you have this thing that occurs, and clearly, the, and their, their point is, there is a, a long-term um, problem. There is a long-term impact mm -hmm. um, that it is not just, okay, well, this thing happened and we've, you know, isn't that a shame and now we've taken care of it, but that it goes on to be this source of recurring trauma. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they've had these, these mental health outcomes and this impact on mental health. And that's in the actual shooting scenarios where we're seeing that. And where we're able to measure that really clearly, um, we haven't even begun to study what that impact is in what mm -hmm. we've just been describing, where there isn't an actual event, but you believe there is. Right. So that was an interesting one. And then I want to finally finish up today, and you may have something else to add, but I want to finish up today with a story I ran across last night. And this is a, uh, a Hollywood studio a film studio that is looking for investors for a film that's already done. It's been, it's in post-production. And this is a film about a 17 year old girl who uses, I'm quoting, her wits, survival skills and compassion to fight for her life and those of her fellow classmates against a group of live streaming school shooters. So we now have a live, we have a school shooting movie called, wait for it, Run, Hide, Fight. Uh, so yeah, so now in addition to the, already the trauma we've talked about, the fear that people already have, the belief that a school shooting is ready to happen at any moment, we are now going to further perpetrate or, or perpetuate that myth by putting into the, the, uh, minds of, of anyone that wants to go see this movie that we have these live streaming school shooters uh, because this is what happens in American schools all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have much to say. I mean, I don't have much to say about it. You know, I don't. <laughs> I mean, are you speechless or are you apathetic? I'm more apathetic. Like, yeah, it's a dumb idea. I just don't have, I just don't. Of all the things to get outraged about, like I'm, I'm more outraged that we are subjecting kids to super scary, ultra realistic drills while they're supposed to be in class learning. 
Well, the, I, just can't, I just can't I, get my outrage up for something case, like this. Like, it's just stupid. In this particular case, this movie is sort of voluntary trauma. I mean, you, you can pay and yeah. go see it or you don't have to. Where our other, the circumstances we've been talking about throughout the podcast are sort of a captive audience that's yeah. being subjected to it without their necessarily their consent. And actually, what would happen to them in a disciplinary standpoint if they said, you know what, I'm not doing this? Yeah. Well, and I, I think you raise a good point that a, a movie like this perpetuates that myth that school shootings are happening all the time. But you know what? This movie is not alone in perpetuating that. Um, you know, every I mean, think of uh, all of the media interviews that you and I do. You know, the reporters are constantly laboring under the assumption that school shootings happen all the time and that they're happening all the time. And one is unacceptable, and we have to repeat that all the time. One school shooting is unacceptable, but they are incredibly statistically rare. So it's not just this movie that is feeding into that misperception that our schools are, you know, just firefights. All that it's just a firefight all the time. And so that is a, a misperception that has to be continued to be broken down. And it's tough because at the same time, we have to work to prevent violence in our schools. So the rare occurrence, we have to work to prevent them. But we also have to work to push back against the misperception that they're happening all the time. And so that that movie is not an isolated thing. I mean, there's episodes of TV about school shootings. There's been other movies about school shootings. There was, you know, remember you were all upset about the uh, Fashion Week, the sweatshirts where they were gla glamorizing, uh, you know, school shootings. That's yeah, just, I, you know, I, I think of the families that have had these horrific tragedies happen and that somebody is going to somehow make this into, I, I mean, it's different if it's a, a if it's a, a documentary or an examination of it. I, I'm not saying that we can't ever talk about it, but to dramatize it as like, you know, die hard, but in a school or something well, just I think seems to me to be like. Delete well, I don't, and I don't know if the movie is glamorizing it or, or glorifying it like Die Hard, but happening in a school shooting. I think it is probably an artist who has a very not nuanced understanding of what school shootings are and that they've seen what's happening in the media and they think, oh my God, it's horrific that we have school shootings happening in our school and that this is what they think is a helpful artistic statement about that. Um, I think yeah, it's a, I'm, I'm not subscribing to the artistic I, theory. I'm subscribing to this is would be kind of cool to do Die Hard in the school and kids would go see it. Uh, so I guess you and I have different. I'm not. I'm not defending. I'm not defending that. I'm saying it's someone who doesn't understand the nuance and does not understand the full picture of school safety. But you know, they do understand the fear that people have and the willingness that people have to believe that this happens all the time, and therefore, I'm going to go see. A movie about it as well so mm -hmm. it, it's you know it's just one of those things that i think i think it's always good for us to kind of question even though yes clearly they have the right to make that movie and we have the right to go or not go but but maybe we need to occasionally sort of question but then i guess on the other hand if you made a movie you know a, a realistic movie about a school where a kid you know throws his homework in the wastebasket and uh, knocks his books off the desk. It's not a super exciting movie. So I guess there's... Well, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is I wish that people who are artistically inclined would partner um, with people who actually understand this, would partner with educators, would, par would partner with experts in the field, and would be able to look at this problem in a way that is nuanced and is dynamic and is interesting. Because I think there is a, a lot of really interesting aspects of it to explore, um, as opposed to a sort of a sensationalized, uh, unrealistic well, version. Probably not as much money to be made on that particular uh, well, that's not really approach to it. But circling back around, I do think that um, for our listeners who are sitting out there as, as union members, um, I guess one thing that we didn't talk about in the beginning when we were talking about the union um, connection is I think it's really, I, I think that uh, we've seen how parents can be really strong advocates for what's happening and for mm -hmm. good change in schools. And, and actually parents are the ones that raised a lot of these initial concerns in terms mm -hmm. of the trauma. But I, I, I really encourage our union members out there, do not underestimate as well the advocacy and the impact that teachers can have saying enough, we need this, not that. We need more of this, we need less of that. And I think it's good that the union, I've always said for a long time, how is this not a, a union mm -hmm. issue when it is a, 
a personal safety issue of, of the union membership. So I'm glad to see that leadership coming um, and to, you know, I would encourage all of our listeners to use that advocacy and push your local unions to become involved in securing appropriate training and appropriate um, drills and exercises and really getting that educational perspective infused into school safety in your in your districts because the union has the potential to do that. Yeah. So, so there yeah. you have it. So um, we always will wave to the folks who are joining us um, live on YouTube and say hello to the folks who are joining us on the podcast. You can, uh, if you are just stumbled across this, you can subscribe to this wherever you normally get podcasts, whether that's on iTunes or Google Play or Stitcher or Tuned In and all the other podcast places. You can also find it directly on our website, which is www.eschoolsafety.org. If you head there, you can find links to other episodes of this podcast, to other ver video versions, to the webinars, and then to all of the other um, resources that we have available on the website. And uh, we always ask to you know rate and review and subscribe. That helps other people who uh, are similarly situated find work like this and find the resources. And then all Always, you know, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. So and keep in mind, next week is a webinar week. We are talking about threat assessment management. So uh, that'll be a good conversation about some proactive things that we can be doing. So there you have it. And uh, until next time, thanks. <laughs>